Hello, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here again in the second uh, CINI webinar. So um, today we have the pleasure to have Professor Giulia Grantini from the University of Pavia as uh, our guest. Um, so, but before talking about Giulia, uh, I would like to say some few words. So I'm Ana Flavia Nogueira. Um, I am one of the principal investigators of CINI. CINI is a center for innovation on new energies that was established in 2018 here in Brazil. So CINI compromised the most important universities in the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, CINI, the Center for Innovation on New Energies, it's a center that is funded by the FAPESP. That's, FAPESP is the Sao Paulo uh, Science Foundation for Science. And also CINI is also supported by, by Shell, by, by, by the company. Uh, so they are our sponsors. So today, so we, we are starting uh, recently with a series of this webinar. Our first speaker was Professor James Durant from Imperial College. So today we have Professor Julia from the University of Pavia. So before uh, I welcome Julia to our studio, uh, I'd like to give you some uh, instructions uh, about how this works. So this uh, webinar is being broadcasting through YouTube. Uh, so as soon as um, uh, we finished, uh, Julia finished her talk, we're going to open for questions. So you can, you are able to uh, ask Julia questions um, through the chat from the YouTube. So I ask you to um, uh, write down your questions, but please do not forget to put your name and also the name of your institutions. Um, of course, we are going to try to, to take most of the questions. We're not sure if we're going to be possible to take all of them, but at least the most of them. So, so then, um, with that, uh, I would like to welcome Giulia Grantini to our studio. Hello, Giulia. Hello, Hannah. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Oh, it definitely for for, for me. It's I would say this is a, is a, is a double. Um, is a I'm very proud to have you here. Um, is is uh, for two reasons. Because Julia is, is a great friend of mine, uh, but also because Julia is um, amazing, a fantastic uh, researcher. I can say that uh, this, uh, in the area of perovskites, Julia is one of the most uh, important and brilliant researchers in the, in the photovoltaics in perovskite solar cells. So, Julia, thank you very much for, for having accepting our invitation. Thank you, Anna. Too kind. Uh, I'll say some few words about uh, your brilliant career till now. So I didn't know that, Julia. I thought it was that you were like a chemist as, as I am. So then uh, mm -hmm. I was really surprised when you, when you sent me your, your CV. So Julia actually has a degree in physical. Uh, she's a physical engineer. Yes, true. Yeah, um, I thought it was a chemist. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, Julia got um, her uh, degree in 2008. And also, she obtained her PhD in, uh, in physics in uh, Politecnico of Milano in Italy. So, uh, from 2012 and uh, from 2015, uh, Julia was a, a postdoc uh, in the Italian Institute for Technology, uh, working with uh, photophysics of advanced polymer, ox uh, advanced polymer oxide hybrid solar cells. So, Julia, in 2015, uh, she joined the PFL in, uh, with a, a, a fellowship from the Marie Curie. It's a very prestigious fellowship in Europe. Uh, Julia, since uh, July 2000, uh, since uh, 2019, Julia is associate professor at physical chemistry department at the University of Pavia, Pavia in Italy. So Julia, uh, in Pavia now, Julia is running her group. The name is PV Square Two. Uh, and also, she's uh, she's running a, a, a big grant in uh, in Europe, the High Nano, aiming to develop advanced hybrid perovskites. So Julia, she's author of 91 peer-reviewed uh, papers, uh, which brings her uh, age index factor of 44, and with more than 14,000 citations. Uh, Julia is is also part of the editorial board of Ken. 
She's a chief editor of International Journal of Photo Energy and also uh, of the SN Applied Science. So Julia has many, many prizes. Um, I'm very impressed. So in 2018, Julia uh, uh, was being awarded with the UPAC Young uh, Scientist Prize in Optics in 2017. In 2007, uh, 2019, last year, so Julia also received two prizes, two important prizes, the Swiss Prize, a uh, Physical Society Prize in Applied Physics, and more recently, the US third prize in 2019 in Physical Science. Uh, and Julia also, she's is considered one of the top scientists in, uh, and also in, uh, not only in, uh, in material science, but also in the uh, top Italian scientists. Uh, so Julia, it's, it's amazing your curriculum, congratulations for that in such a very short time. And it's very my pleasure to have you here to speak about um, to Deeper of Sky. So um, thank you very much. Hope to see you soon. And now I leave the studio with you. So thank you, Anna. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here with you, with the audience, uh, to join uh, this fantastic event that you have organized. So thank you for your words. Uh, it's, it's really a great pleasure. So let me uh, share the, the screen so that we can start talking about my work. Okay, so my work relates uh, on uh, um, perovskite solar cells uh, in the framework of uh, uh, new generation uh, uh, energy source. We, we know indeed that energy has a dominant role on climate change and climate related challenges, uh, uh, accounting for 60% of the global CO2 emission. Uh, nowadays, 1.2 billion people still don't have access to electricity. So that's one of the biggest challenges that we have to face as scientists, as humanity. And by 2050, we need energy for 10 billion people. Of course, renewables can lead a paradigm shift in the global energy sector and uh, ensure a global access to affordable energy. Solar energy, in particular, will be a key player covering up to 30% of the global energy demand. Nowadays, as we know very well, silicon technologies dominate the market. Uh, however, they are very much technologically intensive in terms of manufacturing process and energy consuming. Uh, so the future for photovoltaics is to satisfy a modern request of energy, which should be efficient, but also low cost, adaptable, easily accessible, I would say portable to, to, the, to um, respond to everyday needs. For instance, integrated in smart windows or smart cars. So the question now is, how can science and innovation bring us closer to this goal, to this energy revolution? Well, fundamental science and research must sustain this paradigm shift by developing new materials, new concepts, and new understanding to drive innovation into new disruptive technologies. So let's have a look now on the rapid advance of new generation photovoltaic technologies, in particular hybrid perovskite technology, which has emerged in the very recent years, in less than a, in a decade, and has really revolutionized the field of photovoltaics. In just a decade of research, as I mentioned, the perovskite solar cell outperformed all the existing thin film photovoltaic technologies in terms of solar to electricity efficiency and can now compete with the silicon technology. So they're really considered a big thing in the solar energy and one of the top emerging technology as defined, for instance, by the World Economic Forum. So perovskite solar cell consists of ultra thin layer of these semiconductors um, in the form of an AEX3 structure. Uh, 
where A is an organic cation, such as methyl ammonium, B is a metal cation, such as lead, and X an halogen ion, such as iodine, bromide, or chloride. Uh, the beauty of this material is that uh, it can be deposited by very simple um, solution processed methods and formulated as inks which can be deposited employing routine printing processes uh, on large area flexible substrate with an immediate impact uh, on large area uh, integrated photovoltaics. The perovskites, as I show you here, have these three-dimensional structures forming this crystalline network. So let me just show you with this video an example of the 3D perovskite structure. So you start from the precursors, uh, which are, as we see in a second, in the form of powder. You can mix this powder with a solvent, you dilute them, and with simple, you, as you see here, solution-based processes, you can deposit the tin film, the solvent rice, and you have your crystalline perovskite film, which is formed. This is really the beauty behind this material, and it shows you uh, the ease and the simple process of self-assemble of crystallization of these materials. Um, of course, it's very simple, but uh, it also took a while to optimize and control the deposition parameters to get a uniform film, which is crucial to have uh, an efficient uh, material for an efficient device. As you can see here, the parameters controlling the deposition of the film really influence the uh, morphology of the resulting film and therefore the physical properties of the materials, for instance, uh, charge, diffusion, length, trap density, and so on. So the process is simple, but a lot of care has been taken to optimize the morphology of the perovskite film. What's the architecture? Well, hybrid perovskite solar cells employing a sandwich architecture where the perovskite layer is sandwiched in between an electron and a hole transporting materials, as you can see here from the cross sectional images. Uh, the interface is the device. This is particularly true also for perovskite solar cells when light is absorbed by the perovskite materials, then charges can diffuse towards the perovskite bulk layer upon reaching the interfaces where charge transfer happens to the top and the bottom electrodes. So depending on the order of the electrodes, you may have NIP or PIN configurations. And in particular, the mesoporous configuration, the one in the middle, is particularly attractive uh, holding nowadays the record of power conversion efficiency. In this case, a mesoporous titanium dioxide layer is used as electron transporting material that was, that was coming from the um, disensitized solar cell concept. Let's go a little bit more into details. Uh, the hybrid perovskites are indeed an ideal material for photovoltaic conversion because they hide beautiful and unique properties. In terms of eye absorption coefficient across the whole visible range, so this makes the material very thin with respect, for instance, to silicon solar cells, they can um, have a tunable absorption by changing the uh, material composition, for instance, the halogen ion. Um, exciton binding energy is very low in this material, so you have direct photogeneration of free carriers, long carrier diffusion length, efficient charge transport and low trap density, which stands for the very low non-radiative recombination rate and high open circuit voltage of the solar cells. These are all very interesting optoelectronic properties of this material. So despite the potential of perovskite, nowadays a big barrier prevents their market uptake. Uh, they are low cost, they are efficient, as you can see here in what is called the golden triangle for perovskite, but they are not stable when exposed to air, moisture, thermal stress. They degrade, 
with a possible, even possible release of toxic element. That's the challenge, preventing perovskite degradation. So you can see here, this is an example of the perovskite solar cell exposed to air or water. You see that the material from black goes back to yellow, to the precursors. That means irreversible degradation. How to measure uh, the stability? What's the stability mean? What stability means? Well, stability basically is the lifetime of the solar cell. When you go, you buy a solar module, you want to know the lifetime of the solar module. Of course, uh, to test the stability of a perovskite solar cell, we cannot wait the time of the warranty of the module, 20, 25 years, but there are uh, accelerated aging tests that we can perform to monitor the evolution in time of the power conversion efficiency of the cell under aging and accelerated testing conditions. For instance, as you can see here, uh, the solar cell is stable if, if the drop in the efficiencies over time is less than 20% when measured at one sun of full illumination at maximum power point of the cell for at least 1,000 hours. Uh, this is uh, one of the tests that we usually um, carry uh, out when we want to see the material and the device stability. However, very recently, there is a beautiful uh, uh, comparative work, uh, which I mentioned here, where uh, people are trying to find a consensus about how to measure the stability of perovskite solar cells. This means, for instance, choosing the perfect conditions in terms of temperature, uh, ambient versus, uh, for instance, uh, encapsulated solar cells, or which uh, um, humidity and so on. So this is a really hot topic in the perovskite community. So how to improve perovskite stability is the question. And it's a question also of my research group. So how to improve stability? Well, when uh, looking at literature approach, there are different uh, approaches. First approach is to improve the intrinsic material stability. For instance, uh, uh, improving the crystallinity of the three-dimensional perovskite structure by adding uh, cross-linking agents, like it's shown in this work, in the, in the slide, or a very effective strategy was to uh, modify the composition of the perovskites with uh, what is called cation cascade engineering, uh, putting together different ions to again improve the structural stability of the material itself. Or on the other side, there are also many interesting, um, I would say, external approach where instead of improving the perovskite material stability, we can interface the perovskite with other layers. For instance, in this case, they use graphene and 2D materials to protect the 3D perovskites from the agents which uh, induce the degradation of the material. Um, it's also important to mention that um, uh, when talking about the 3D perovskites or the standard hybrid perovskite, cation, the organic cation, is also a source of instability. So one can think of uh, modifying the organic cations to choose the perfect and most stable cations. However, there is a structural um, requirement limit which impose the dimension of the A cation to be less than 2.6 Armstrong. That's the rule, the, an empirical law called the Cosmic Tolerance Factor Law, uh, which basically says that to have a stable cubic 3D structure, you see that the A cation, which fills the void of the 3D structure, cannot be too large. And this puts a limit on the possible organic cations that we can choose, for instance, methyl ammonium, formamidinium, or cesium. So the library is quite narrow. So what if we decide that we use an organic cation which is bigger than that? 
Well, the answer is quite uh, um, logical, I would say. If we put a cation that is larger than the void, the 3D structure is not stable anymore and it can be then disrupted. And from this concept, I want to drive you into the concept of what is called a layered perovskite family, or namely 2D perovskites. They are a completely different family of hybrid perovskites that you can obtain, for instance, imagining to have the 3D perovskite and then you cut along the inorganic planes. So you have your material results into single inorganic layers which are spaced by large spacers, by large organic cations. 2D perovskites have the fo this formula here. And in this case, you have single inorganic layers spaced by these bulk organic cations. So then you have many organic cations that you can use even more robust, for instance, and uh, less prone to degradation, which can be used to form this layered proskite. Why are they interesting? Well, 2D proskites have attracted in the last few years a lot of interest in the community because of the much improved stability with respect to the 3D ones. You can see here, upon exposure to water, the 3D from black goes yellow, while for the 2D, it's much more stable. As indicated also here, showing the normalized efficiency of a 2D device with respect to the 3D device. So this can be a possible solution to solve the stability issue. Well, actually, um, yes and no, I would say. Uh, why? Because the 2D perovskites are very interesting, but as you can see here, the absorption of the 2D perovskite, it's more, it's narrower, and also they have strong exciton binding energy. They are natural quantum well, where the exciton is confined in the inorganic planes. Uh, so these are not ideal properties for uh, photovoltaics. And in addition, you also have these large organic cations, uh, which um, can hinder the charge uh, transport in the materials. So these are not ideal properties for 2D-based uh, perovskite solar cells. Indeed, if you use this material in a working device, you might reach efficiencies of 1 or 2%. Um, actually, it's important to notice that uh, within the family of uh, 2D proskites, um, the material uh, library is really broad. So you can have 2D proskites in the form of Rugen's popper with this uh, head to tail arrangement, uh, with this distortion here, or Dion Jacobson phase where they are all aligned in organic planes. But if you check, in a more um, detailed way, the layer proskite itself can be organized in different way depending on the aggregation of the inorganic layers. You might have one single inorganic layer spaced with the organic, by the organic cations, two, three, or infinite. So a family of low dimensional perovskite is very broad. You have the 3D on one side, but looking at the low dimensional 2D proskite, you have the single layered space by the organic cations. This is called N equal to 1, that's important for our discussion later on, 2D proskite. Or you have intermediate situation where, as I, as I, as I mentioned to you before, you have two or three layers put together, where the two layers you see here, um, they, 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 are, they are spaced by the organic, large organic cations, and in between you have also the presence of a smaller cation. So you can have an equal to two, an equal to three, and different families of low dimensional proskites. They are very interesting because uh, you may find uh, a balancing between uh, stability and efficiency when you deal, when you manage to have uh, these n equal to 2, 3, or quasi 2D proskites. As you can see here, indeed, uh, the efficiency grows with the number of layers n, 
mainly due to the redshift and the, of the absorption that gets broader. The concept uh, and the idea that uh, is at the basis of, uh, of my work, of my research work, is to create a new synergy between fundamental understanding of the material structure and interface physics to create a new hybrid framework putting together the 2D and the 3D perovskites. So we can uh, benefit from the 3D efficiency and 2D stability, creating new functional, stable and efficient 3D, 2D interfaces. Of course, as you can imagine, you can build this new concept where you put the two words together in many different ways. For instance, you can simply take the precursors of the 2D, the precursors of the 3D, putting them together in a blend, forming in this interdispersing mode, a kind of a mixture of 2D and 3D. Another approach, which is the one I want to, to show you and to discuss with you today, is uh, to create a 3D, 2D by layer with the idea to use the 2D layer as a top protective layer, which can intrinsically stabilize the active component of my perovskite solar cells. For the 2D perovskite layer, you can use different organic cations. And for instance, I will show you here, first results with the phenylethyl ammonium and the fluorinated uh, derived cations. So first of all, uh, we need to engineer this 3D, 2D by layer, where as you can see here, the 3D is the main component of the active layer, while the 2D is on top uh, and is uh, 30 to 40 nanometers thick. So the first question here is how to engineer this 3D, 2D composite to have this really clean layer by layer by layers. Uh, so, well, that, that was challenging. That was challenging because um, when you create this by layer, first thing you can think of is to deposit the 2D on top of the 3D. But this may risk to, uh, may induce the, the 3D perovskite to, to dissolve when you deposit the 2D, la the 2D layer on top. So, in order to avoid that and to have this clean structure, we used a two-step approach where the triple perovskite consists of this material with this composition with an excess of lead iodide, which is very important because in the second step, we use the 2D cation dissolved only in IPA, which reacts in situ with the excess of lead iodide and forms this shell, this top layer of 2D perovskite. So in this way, you have this 3D, 2D layer, and you can monitor the formation of this layer by multiple experiments, for instance, XLV or also photoluminescence. Here is an example, which shows you the p-hull uh, comparing the top and the bottom uh, emission and excitation. Um, for instance, here you see that from bottom excitation, you only have p-l from the 3D perovskite even if you have put the 2D on top, while in this uh, figure that shows the PL exciting from the top surface, you do see that when you have in red 2D perovskites, you do see this emission at the wider uh, band gap region, which corresponds to the emission of the 2D perovskite layer. So we try to implement that in the, fish, in the devices, uh, where you have this 3D 2D bilayer structure. And here I show you some results using this phenylethyl ammonium based cation, which is one of the most studied in the frame of uh, 2D 3D perovskite solar cells. So you can see that device, uh, if in, in a mesoporous configuration, the device show interesting results. And in particular, with the use of this PAI 2D 3D layer, you have an improvement in the device VOC. And very importantly, you have an improvement, a net improvement on the stability when this 2D 3D layer is um, 
uh, employed in your active uh, materials in the perovskite device. So for instance, this is an example of what I mentioned to you before of the measurements of the stability of the device, uh, measuring the evolution of the power conversion efficiencies in time, comparing the only 3D with the 2D 3D. Uh, the empty and uh, um, uh, the filled uh, symbols uh, indicate samples in ambient air or uh, encapsulated or not encapsulated but in nitrogen atmosphere. You can see that in both cases, the improvement of the stability with the 2D over layer is uh, evident. Um, the 2D perovskite layer is fundamental in uh, the in better stability uh, observed in this graph because it has multiple roles. And in particular, it makes the 3D perovskite surface more robust and more water repellent, which is really the key to have a more stable device. Of course, when you put the, 3D, the 2D on top of the 3D, many questions arise uh, with respect to the interface properties. So interface properties means crystal structure, uh, means uh, interface physics, and we have to control all of them to optimize the device performances. For instance, it was quite interesting to see that uh, doing a GVAX analysis, uh, you can see that uh, the crystal orientation itself to 2D perovskite may vary depending on the perovskite composition. And in this qualitative picture, you may have a more oriented or a more distorted 2D perovskite. But in addition, it's also very interesting to notice that, for instance, for the PEI device, you do have not only, uh, you see here from the XRV, a simple interface, but you have more peaks appearing, which indicate that the real interface from 2D, 3D is more complex than what we think. So basically, it's not only a 3D and a n equal to 1 2D layer, but it's a more complex interface. And that's what I want to explore more with you in the next slide. So how the cation and the interface structure can impact on the overall device performance? This is the question. So can we um, know and can we understand more on these interface properties in terms of the structure that the 2D uh, perovskite forms at the interface? So to do that, we choose a um, new family of 2D cations, um, which we uh, synthesize, uh, which are based on thiophin cations, as you can see here. We call them 2TMI, 3TMI, and 2TEI, which we use uh, using the same engineering approach that I explained to you to form this 2D overlayer. So you have this thin layer of 2D on top of the 3D mostly parallel oriented as shown by this qualitative GVAX picture. Um, let's go, let's explore more the interface properties uh, and how these interface properties can depend on the chemistry and the nature of the 2D perovskites. Uh, you can see that the results are very interesting. From PHAL and from XRD, it's immediately uh, evident that the structure that the 2D perovskite forms at the interface using these slightly different cations is different. For instance, from the PL spectra, we do see um, the emission from the 2D perovskites, but for the 3 TMI and 2 TMI, this emission is a bit red shifted with respect to pure 2D perovskites. And when I mean pure 2D perovskites, it's the N equal to one perovskite. So this gives a clear evidence that at the very interface, we have the formation of a mixture of phases that can be N equal to one or N equal to two, depending on the structure of the 2D perovskite. 
So for the 2T, and this is also confirmed by the XRD, where you can see that for the 2TMI, you have N equal to one, that's the emission here, and N equal to two phases. For the 3TMI, you may have only two, N equal to two phase. For the 2TMI, you have predominantly N equal to one phase. So you see different organic cations, different 2D, and different interface phase and structure. So uh, this uh, is quite interesting because uh, it tells us that the real interface is something that is more complex than what we thought at the beginning. How this relates to device? This is the question. Well, in all cases, using this 2D on top, uh, we do have uh, improved uh, performances with respect to the control, especially true for the improving the VOC, as we already observed for PEI and other cations. So in this case, it's the 3TMI that outperforms the control, but as you can see, the device performance are rather similar. So now the question is, can we relate uh, the phase of the 2D perovskite with the device performances? Before answering to this point, it's very important to understand uh, the behavior of the solar cell in a dynamical condition. So basically, when we measure perovskite solar cell, that's highly debated. We make the device and then we measure the photovoltaic parameters and the, the JV curves uh, in one day after, three days after, three days after, immediately. So there is a lot of debate uh, because we uh, do have slow processes and doping happening at the, at the device um, side, which can really impact on the performances. For instance, let me um, drive your attention uh, to the controller. The controller, so the 3D perovskite only, when you measure it fresh, shows an efficiency in this case of 19%. After a few days that you leave the device under dark condition, you see that there is an improvement of the efficiency due to these dopants of the HTL and slow processes still not clear happening in the device. And then it stabilized, you see here, around after several weeks. So in this study, we really wanted to check the dynamical behavior of the device efficiency. We did the same for the 2D, 3D solar cells. So the, all the solar cells were stored in dark and dry environment for months, and we measured the device efficiency, you see, after this time. Interestingly, the 2TA device is the one that shows the largest improve in the solar cell, especially the largest improve in the VOC. In addition, the 2TAI is also the cation that shows the largest um, stability uh, of uh, the device compared to the others. So you see in this slide that the stability of the 2TEI based 2D is uh, clearly the highest with respect to the other cations. So can we relate then, the question was, can we relate the device performances and stability with the property of the 2D, 3D uh, interface in terms of the structure of the interface. If you remember, the 2TI cation was the only one that uh, at the interface forms an N equal to one uh, perovskite phase. How does it behave dynamically? So we did the same on thin films, um, monitoring the fresh film and the aged films after four months in the same conditions, and we measured the photoluminescence. So you can see that while the first two cations uh, shows a change in the PL emission, which means, which reflects the structural changes uh, happening at the interface, for the 2TI, the interface structure is 
stable. So only for this case, the interface is stable and is formed by a n equal to 1 to the perovskite. We think that this is a very important observation because basically we believe that if we have a strong cation like the 2TI, a strong rigid 2D perovskites that can form a stable n equal to 1 phase, this can prevent any structural modification of the interface and that, and that can ultimately lead to a stable device uh, with stable performances. This is not the case if the interface is uh, more jelly-like, is less rigid, so that we have the transformation of the interface from a pure 2D perovskite into a quasi-2D with n equal to two or more, which is possibly due to the movement, the displacement of these small ions into the surface. So ion distribution at the surface can change, can impact on the structural properties of the proskite and ultimately on the device stability. That's general. We also check it for different cations and for instance, also for the PEI, it's the same. A pure n equal to one phase is formed also for 2D uh, based on with this uh, phenylated ammonium cation. So the 2D stabilized the interface, which positively impact device VOC and device stability. Second question is about not only the stability upon aging in time, but we are also interested on thermal effects that can affect interface aging and therefore device stability. So to assess that, we also checked the aging upon um, thermal stress, as you can see here at 50 degrees. And these are the results with the same uh, thin films upon exposing the film at 50 degrees uh, up to 360 minutes. So as you can see in this graph, again, for the first two cations, you do have a restructuring of the interface. You see the n equal to one emission decreases, the n equal to two, and then a broad PL comes up. While for the 2TA, this cation is very much stable, also upon thermal stress. That's also a very important observation because, again, it shows that this interface gives you a more, the most stable uh, device performances. Um, we were... Uh, Mm, I, I would like now to, to uh, go a little bit more into details on these thermal effects on device performances. And to do that, we very recently uh, published this work in collaboration with uh, Ana Flavia and her group, monitoring uh, the thermal effects on device performances and relating it to the material properties. So what we did, we took two reference uh, 2D perovskites based on PEA and 2TMI, two cations that I already presented to you. And then we measured the, uh, we, we, we made, we fabricated perovskite solar cells, and then we measured the performance of the device after uh, imposing a thermal stress is indicated here in this thermal cycle. So the device was, uh, um, uh, the temperature was increased from zero to 100 degrees, and then the device was left at 50 degrees for uh, 360 minutes. Sorry, this is three, up to 360 minutes. Here I show you the device performances. Well, as you can see in this graph, it's interesting to notice that for the reference with no 2D, upon exposing the device to this thermal cycle, we have a reduction of the efficiency from 20% to 18%. That's an average value uh, on measured on 36 devices. When we have these 2D, 3D layers, in both cases, you see that the reduction 
or the power conversion efficiency is um, less pronounced. So this indicates that with the, this 2D layer, we do improve also the thermal stability of the perovskite device. Let's go a little bit more into the details and monitor the thermal effects on the interface with this beautiful technique in situ GVAX that were, um, you have in Brazil at the Synchrotron National Laboratory. So in collaboration with Anna, we did these measurements to really monitor in situ and in real time the effect of thermal aging on the material. Here, I present you the data only on 3D perovskites. As you can see here, uh, you, the, the 3D perovskites, when exposed to this uh, thermal uh, cycle, shows a reduction of the diffraction peak that corresponds to the 2D perovskite, uh, that corresponds sorry, to the 3D perovskite. That's not 2D here. So you have reduction here of the perovskite and still the presence of this diffraction peak, which is related to a uh, residual um, amount of lead iodide. So what we do is we take the 3D and then we put uh, the uh, 2D on top with the engineering method that I discussed with you at the beginning. And again, we repeat the same measurements with this thermal cycle. It's interesting to notice that in both cases, first of all, the signal related to the perovskite does not vary. So you see here, for the 3D, there is a reduction. So that means that the perovskite starts to degrade, but that's not the case. When you put a 2D layer on top, a 2D perovskite layer on top, the signal related to the 3D perovskite, it's super stable. So there is no degradation of the 3D perovskite. So 2D is an effective uh, material that retards the degradation and blocks the degradation of the 3D perovskite under it. In the meantime, it's also interesting to observe that the 2D perovskite undergoes a structural modification during this thermal aging. For instance, for the PEI, you see that the signal related to the N equal to 1 uh, 2D phase uh, slowly decreases in time, which indicates that to prevent the degradation of the 3D, the interface structure is gradually changing. And this is also observed on 2D, um, on uh, photoluminescence imaging. You can see here, for instance, that the peak related to the 2D slowly, uh, the emission peak slowly decreases uh, and gradually disappears uh, in agreement with the, the XRD result. So the 2D perovskite undergoes a structural change which helps on the other side uh, the overall material stability and, uh, the, and it preserves the thermal stability of the 3D perovskite under this thermal effect. So again, uh, take home message is with this method, we can improve the robustness of our active layer with respect to water, moisture, and also thermal stress. Um, what's next? Open questions regard uh, how the structure and the rigidity of the 2D may influence the interface stability, uh, how it affects the charge mobility of the interface, and the structure in terms of uh, uh, the energetics structure of the interface. So that's uh, all the open questions that we want to target uh, with the final aim to give a clear direction for smart optimization of these 2D, 3D by layers um, for efficient and stable new generation of perovskite solar cells. So interface engineering with multi-dimensional perovskite is a powerful tool to improve device performances. However, we should be very careful uh, when we do this 2D, 3D approach because the structure uh, is dynamically changing and this must be taken into account when uh, we want to relate to the structure and interface to device stability. That's the ultimate 
goal of our uh, research. So simultaneous control on structure and performance over time is needed. And as I said before, much um, in-depth studies on the interface, structure, and physics, it's important to address. So with this, let me acknowledge my team at UNIPV. Uh, you can see here the website uh, open position for PhD in postdoc. You can write to me. But I also want to acknowledge my APFL team, and in particular, uh, um, Alberto Sutanto, who made the largest part of this work, Valentin Quellens, and my colleague, Professor Nazirudin at APFL. The fundings, my excellent collaborators and nice friends. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Julia, for this um, fantastic, inspiring talk about the Perovskites. I think we, we learn a lot, especially the students that actually in the beginning um, pursuing a career in, the, in this area of uh, Perovskites, a lot of things to learn, especially in, the, in terms of fundamental questions. I think we have many questions still to, to answer in spite of the, the high efficiency of these devices. I believe there are many open questions in terms of the fundamentals of these materials. And especially for this 2D, I think it's, it's, it's really amazing to see um, actually what's going on after, after you thermal annealing these materials, after this device efficiency, uh, uh, what's going on in there. And I hope that we can continue our collaboration looking for to sure. more specific what's actually going, going on after we in, somehow we start this um, stability tests. So um, the, the chat is now is uh, we are we are open for, for questions. I think we, we can uh, we can start now. Um, we have a question from uh, from Lucas uh, Escalon. Marcelo, can you? Uh, yes, Lucas is my PhD student, so she has a question for you, Julia. Yeah, so hello, Lucas. Uh, why it was study the dynamics of 2D, 3D inter interface with 2PA compared with 2TMA instead of the others? Can you comment on that? Well, uh, we studied all of them. So in the publication, you can see there are all of them. We just pick up two cases where um, the PEI was uh, a reference for a very stable interface, while the 2TMI was one that um, showed multiple phases. So not only an equal to one, but multiple phases. So we wanted to get these two, because the 2TI behaves very well, but very similar to the PEI. So to have a, a kind of a reference, to uh, study uh, the thermal stability and how this affects uh, different uh, phases, we choose this too. So I hope that clarifies your point. Okay, I think um, you have also a question from uh, Professor Francisco Marques. From the Francisco is, is also, I think you met him before, Julia. Um, yeah, this is Professor from the Physics Institute at Unicamp. Yeah, hello, Francisco. Nice to, to, to meet you again. So passivation layers in inorganic devices uh, reduce recombination. Of course, I didn't uh, have time to talk about that, but uh, we, uh, uh, we studied that. We studied the recombination at the interface. There is a JFISCAM letter from 2019 where we explore the interface recombinations uh, co using uh, combined measurements of transient PL and TRMC, microwave conductivity, to really monitor the recombination at the interface. And what we observed was that with the 2D layer, in that case was a PAI based 2D, uh, the recombination is retarded because of a surface passivation effects that the 2D induces on top of the 3D. We are uh, still studying this process. Uh, for instance, we are currently doing uh, photoluminescence quantum yield measurements coupled with uh, uh, also uh, of the net film and of the device to really understand better this uh, uh, aspect. But for sure, the passivation 
um, reduce the recombination mechanism at the interface by reducing the surface traps. We have a question here from the, um, Dr. Diego Barnes from, from CISEN, from the, um, uh, the Brazilian company that is, uh, um, is, is producing the OPV. So Diego, um, thank you for your presence, Diego. Have you already, so hello Diego, have you already tested this approach of 2D in, in PIN structure? Uh, yes, uh, my PhD, uh, Matteo is actually doing that right now. It's having very nice results and it's possible. But of course, uh, you have to um, think about the energetics of the 2D and 3D to get uh, an efficient energy, an efficient, sorry, electron and hole transfer at the interface. Uh, so it's possible, but you have to carefully deal with and carefully manage the uh, energetics of the interface and the structure, of course. So you have to engineer again the deposition of the 2D, but that's possible. So it's ongoing research. Do you think it's possible to apply on large area with compatible deposition techniques? Yes, I think so. Uh, we are also partially working on that, um, but there are some uh, results very recent in literature showing that this can be adaptable also on the large area. Okay, um, we have a question from Letty, Letty Pradeep, I think. Okay, hello. Um, have you prepared this 2D 3D under ambient or in glow box? Also for the shelf life stability studies, these devices were in nitrogen ambient. So preparation is in a glow box. Uh, for the stability studies, uh, when I mentioned these four months uh, uh, aging, they were done in dark and dry environment but not in nitrogen ambient so i think i have uh continued this this question julia um yeah have, have how, how is about the efficiency when you when you try to make like the devices outside of the glove box have you compared um, to the, when you make them like inside so i think hannah that the point uh, is uh, the percentage of relative humidity you have outside that really makes the difference. So there are different values depending on the relative humidity that you can get. So to avoid this dispersion in values, it's much better to always make your device in a controlled uh, atmosphere like in the glow box. So it's not impossible, but it, it fluctuates too much the preparation outside the glow box. Yeah, because because if if understood this two D layer is uh, protects not I mean it's also action uh, is acting as a kind of passivating layer because you see the increase in EVOC, but as it shows how, um, for your contact angles measurement you, you see that this two D layer is more like hydrophobic so it's right. somehow it's protecting more fr from the, from the moisture so I think it it'd be nice to compare uh, what Definitely. happens when you make them like totally outside of the glove box. Because Definitely. Yeah, in, uh, in uh, the University of Pagliana, we have, uh, uh, we want to um, compare it. And indeed we have a dry box with the uh, controlled humidity. And that mm -hmm. is really crucial to do these kind of studies. Yeah, but I don't have an answer yet. Okay. Um, we have a question from, um, from the south of Brazil, from uh, uh, Malaji. Sorry, I cannot pronounce your first name. Yes. Okay, so, hello. Uh, is intramolecular hydrogen interaction in TMA perovskite responsible for temperature intensity, insensitive PL efficiency? Well, that's a good question. Um, definitely, as I was also discussing very deeply with Anna, um, the, 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 the kind of structure of 2D, so how rigid is the structure, which can be affected by hydrogen interactions, 
can have an impact on uh, the overall interface uh, stability. Uh, it's difficult to target, but definitely it might be one of the reasons responsible for uh, this uh, uh, robust behavior versus temperature. That, that's for sure. More calculations, I would say, are also needed uh, to really understand this point. Um, we have a question from, uh, from Matteo Zolanda from Unicamp. Are the changes at hello Mateus? Are the changes at PL after the device is heated permanent? They are reversible. Yeah, they are reversible. Oh, it is interesting. Uh, That's to, very uh, interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think then then you can you can go for the next question from Eduardo Machado. I think he's uh, is is about how we can actually probe this. In situ. Which are which surface techniques uh, Edward is asking are the most promising to investigate at the open question you mentioned? Well, that's a good question. That's why I'm happy to collaborate with Anna's group <laughs> uh, and with you, because definitely in situ techniques uh, help in understanding more about the structure. So uh, XRD, SEM under different conditions, they are all very important uh, to address the structural changes. But on top of that, we also need to understand the interface energetics and interface processes. So we should co what we will do is really to combine these uh, surface techniques with these in situ structural uh, uh, observations with uh, optical and optoelectronic measurements uh, like photoluminescence, uh, like uh, um, UPS, XPS to measure the energy levels of the interface, uh, electroluminescence as well to monitor the recombination uh, and trying, you know, to address uh, the question of interface structure and interface elect electric electronic properties. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Rafael Moral. Uh, Rafael is also um, a PhD student uh, in my group. Hello, Rafael. Um, could you comment a little about photon recycling in those 2D 3D interface? Do you believe it's beneficial in this device? Well, in this case, um, we have to think about two points. First point is that light is absorbed first by the 3D. So 2D is not uh, optically active in this sense. So the, the photon recycling mechanism happens as for the, for the only 3D. Um, so the emission of the 3D is not uh, counting for this in this 3D 2D layer. Uh, second point, you also have to think about the, the structure, of course, and the energetics of the 3D 2D. So there is no, um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, a direct effect on that, but people and we are still studying this phenomenon for the 2D 3D device. Do you think? I think um, before before I finish, I think I have some I have some questions uh, for yeah. you uh, for you as well. So we are always talking about this this uh, modifiers now. Uh, let's say this uh, molecules that we use to to make this 2G layer. There are always, of course, I think there. We need to understand more about the structure of the, um, uh, let's say, of most of these additives and try to understand why some of them make just only n equal to one on or others just n equal to two. I think it has to do with the chemical structure. But another thing I think is important is the, the head of these molecules. Always yeah. we use ammonium. We understand it's because the ammonium is actually replacing whatever cesium methyl ammonium is actually uh, in, in the A site of the perovskites. Um, but can you play with not only with the other side, if you, if you understand me, can you play not only with on the other side of the molecule, but also can you 
think about this, the head, because we, of course, we need to interact with the A site of the perovskites. Why all of those molecules is only ammonium? We don't see, and I think this is also the question from Ellen. There is another question here. This because all why we cannot use fluorine as an ion, but fluorine is another side because it's, it's in the other part. But talking about the, the A site, you think that you can even get more thermal stability, whatever more uh, stability against moisture, for instance, just changing the head, changing the yeah. time for the A site. Can you comment on that? Yes, I try, and I'm not a chemist, so you are the chemist, <laughs> so I, I'm not sure about that. Definitely, it's possible. That's that's the beauty of the of this material that you can really change uh, all the pieces of the organic cations, and you still have a stable to the perovskites in the most cases. So, so this is of course a beautiful possibility for these materials to play with that. But of course, you need to, I think, to consider um, two things. First one is the type of 2D perovskites that you are creating. As I mentioned in my slide, you may have different phases, uh, Rudlands Popper or Dion Jacobson phases, where you have different orientation in between the, the inorganic planes that can be like this or like that. And that change uh, and, and so the different structure can have a, an impact of course different heads and tails of the organic cations can impact on that so on the formation of the 2d perovskite but they can also impact that if we think for instance on just one kind the rudlands popper phase for instance uh, they can impact the overall rigidity, I think, of the structure. So you may have a more distorted one, a less distorted one. And these differences can be tuned by changing ammonia with other things because you change the, the weak bonds there and then you change the, the, the rigidity of the structure. So it would be really nice and, and impactful to uh, address this point, Anna. So to, to take, for instance, two or three different extremes, very different molecules, test them into the perovskite and see how the rigidity of the structure are dependent on this. Yeah. It's, it's, that's a hot question. That, that's open question now. Yeah, that's it's open, open question for the students that are, that are listening to us because I think we are in, in the last, um, last years, we're actually looking at the tail, but not looking at the head. And also we can, whatever in the A side, we can put other cations there, not, not only the ammonium cation there. Right. And I know how much this, this can actually be related to stability. It's something that will be very interesting to, to study. Absolutely, I agree. Okay, I think um, you have answered all the questions. Uh, so, Julia, um, thank you. Uh, it's, it was, was an honor for us to have you here today. And I hope to, to meet you soon. I know this pandemic situation is actually making us to, to be apart. Um, we cannot attend conferences anymore, and I don't think that we, we can do it to the end of the year. But I hope to see you soon. And thank you again very much uh, for, for this amazing talk. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much to you and to all the people that uh, uh, joined us for this uh, opportunity. So thank you very much. Uh, stay safe, and I hope to stay see safe. you soon. Ciao. Okay. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Thank you for bye all bye. that for the audience and see you next in the next uh, senior webinar. Thank you.